What I want to do um, this evening is to advance this uh, question a little bit further. Um, questions that in a sense were left over by the architectural uncanny, which because of its framing, um, and this becomes a very important term, both for that work and for the new work, um, because of its framing was largely uh, domestic in its scope, although towards the end of the book it did break out into certain urban questions. So what I'm trying to do now is to look at the general category of, of space in the modern period from the late 19th to the 19th century to the present and try and establish some of the um, critical moments where space became analyzed or part of analysis and where space became pathologized or part of pathologization because I think it's very important to understand the projects for urban plans developed by modernism and later and our own relations to the city in terms of this pathologization. So the following talk is a part of a larger work on the construction of the modern spatial imaginary. Um, and the working title, depending on which publisher I talk to, is either for effect, phobic city, or for academic sort of probity, psychopathologies of modern space. It's an attempt to write what in Walter Benjamin's terms might have been entitled a small history of modern space. It starts from the apparently commonplace premise that space as a category was entirely reconstrued at the end of the 19th century in a way that fundamentally affected the perception experience and in the case of architects and planners, the projected reform of the modern metropolis. In this context, what I'm calling space is of course no more than a cultural and mental construction. For in historical terms, like the body or like sexuality, space is not a constant, but rather as Victor Bergen among, among others has asserted, space has a history. One way of tracing this history would be in the terms that someone like Henri Lefebvre has made common since the 70s. To follow the physical and instrumental expansion of territories and boundaries, what geographers call real space, assisted by technologies of mapping and viewing. In this sense, in a sense, space would be empirical, but also, <coughs> as Kant imagined it, an a priori constant, all-encompassing, unchanging through the centuries, ever ready for occupation and exploitation. A second way of writing the history of space in the modern period would be to trace the history of different forms of spatial representation. Owen Panofsky's History of Perspective, a Symbolic Form, published in 1927 and recently translated into English would be an example of this approach, which indeed tries to join the notion of universal geometrical space, the a priori of Kant, to what he calls individual psychophysiological space, the individual space of a, of a relative and projected kind. And he construes perspective as the attempt to transform the latter into the former, psychophysiological space into mathematical space. A third way of looking at the history of space, following Freud and Lacan and other psychologists and analysts of the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, Freud and Lacan incidentally only merit scornful single entries in Lefebvre's 450 page work of the production of space, would be the history of psychical, interior and exterior space, introjected and projected space. We might take Freud's, if you like, last clue, who towards the very end of his life, and re written on a little leaf of paper found by his deathbed, gave us the following quite enigmatic but quite provocative observation. Space, wrote Freud, may be the projection of the extension of the psychical apparatus. No other derivation is probable. Instead of Kant's a priori determinants 
of our psychical apparatus, psyche is extended. That is, space fundamentally is a projection of the psyche in this last statement of Freud. So one could, in fact, write a history of space considered as a series of individual and cultural projections. So in those three ways of writing history, one as empirical space, one as representation, and one as the construction of individual and collective psyches, um, some attempt has been made in the modern period to, to write that, those kinds of history. But in almost every case, the history of modern space, when it has been attempted, has more often than not been construed as a kind of evolutionary progress. In his last series of essays on space, even Victor Bergen, who I think knows better, traces what he sees as an inevitable and progressive movement from classical space, conceived of as a potentially boundless field of operation of the humanist subject, constructed with all the rigor of perspective. From there to a late modern dispersed space of industrial capitalism, and finally to a postmodern space of psychical internalization, that is from classical externalization to postmodern internalization through modern territorialization. And when we read Guy Debord, for example, or Jean Baudrillard in their constructions of the history of space, we find similar narrations of trajectories that always seem to end or start with perspective and classicism and end in the dissolution of classical space in postmodernist hyperspace. And I have trouble with that kind of a narrative. I have trouble with the kind of narrative that in some way proposes that one form of space replaced another form of space. It's the kind of narrative that avant-garde architects and artists and their apologists like Siegfried Gideon, for example, always want you to believe that in fact their space is the last space replacing all for former spaces, that, that modern space, for example, in its fusion with temporality, has in fact conquered a region of psychic and experiential reality that was unknown to classical space and so on and so forth. And similarly with the, with the contemporary theoreticians of cyberspace, who in fact thump home their message about cybernetics with very trite diagrams of perspectival spatial kind. <coughs> I'm always very interested in these virtual reality glasses which you put on and you find actually thin line perspectives that you walk around. So in fact, we're dealing with a continual re-representation of ways of dealing with space that in fact, although they have a history, also have residues. And it's in dealing with the question of modern space, the space that, in a sense, that I want to characterize in this book, that one finds a problem with the kind of evolutionary narrative, what one might call the problem of a carryover. What do you do, for example, by the, in a narrative of, of progression and evolution, when optical and perspectival models of spatial structure based on the cone of vision and plane of representation, when they are found to represent and used to represent psychical spaces formed by projection and interjection, what do you do with perspectival space, for example, when it crops up in Lacanian diagrams? The problem, that is, of spatial models conceived in one period to center and ground a subject that are then used to comprehend condition where this subject is neither originating nor present and is opposed to, in post-structuralism, I imagine to have disappeared altogether. So these problems of overlap and carryover, I think, give the lie to a certain kind of Hegelian evolutionary history of space. In this talk, I'm not going to solve all these problems, nor am I going to undertake the critique of post-Lacanian optics necessary to reconstruct the geometries of psychical space. But I do want to look at the heterogeneous and apparently bewilderingly complex constructions of space in the modern period in a way that departs somewhat from the linear and overly developmental 
if not evolutionary space, space-time, space-mind model that most historians sketch. In fact, I want to propose a history that sees perspectival a priori space, ideal, material, perspectival, geomet geometrical, as it was reconceived in neo-Kantian thought in the 19th century, late 19th century, a history that places that side by side with psychic space as it emerged in the thought of psychologists and psychoanalysts at the turn of the century, and as having reciprocal and entirely intertwined cultural relations. I want to sketch a history that doesn't see the space of the psyche replacing the space of geometry, but rather that sees the one being grafted, not entirely unproblematically, onto the other, in ways that I think have complicated the question ever since. In short, I'm going to claim that the formation of modern space as a field of material and externalizing activity was from the outset tied to the formulation of space as a mental category of projection. That in other words, when we see the apparent survival of optical mechanisms of perspective in the mental maps drawn by Freud and his followers around interjection and projection, we're in fact looking at a model that was itself constituted as a complex combination of the two notions, and thus a very hybrid no model of, sp of spatial form. And I want to start with the, with the invention, quote unquote, of a particular spatial malady that emerged towards the end of the 19th century, actually precisely datable to 1871. And that malady is called then and has continued to be called agoraphobia. Agoraphobia was um, first understood to be a particularly modern malady uh, in the writings of a, of, a, of, a, of a Berlin doctor, Karl Otto Westphal, and it became very commonly understood as a malady tied to the large spaces of modern urbanism the large spaces of the uh, modern metropolis. And as such, by the end of the 19th century, agoraphobia had been identified in the intellectual circles that uh, <coughs> discussed such questions of, of space and the maladies it caused with modernity, but also because modernity was identified with mechanization, with the history of technology, and because the history of technology was identified with abstraction and reason <coughs> with abstraction. And it was interesting enough, the art historian Wilhelm Waringer, who first brought the notion of agoraphobia into, into play as part of a very complex history of representation and aesthetics that he sketched in Abstraction and Empathy, which was published in 1906. And it was Waringer's thesis that abstraction, that which we characterize as virtually part and parcel of modern space, and agoraphobia, a disease that had been identified in the 1870s as stemming from modern space, were rooted in one and the same human drive. He wrote, the urge to abstraction is the outcome of a great inner unrest inspired in man by the phenomena of the outside world. We might describe this state of inner unrest as an immense spiritual dread of space. Voringer outlined what for him lay beneath this universal <coughs> drive of art towards abstraction that he saw very clearly in the early 1900s and didn't like at all, in fact, argued very strongly against. It was, he argued, founded on no less than a primitive fear of nature and a concomitant desire, quote unquote, to divest the things of the external world of their caprice and obscurity, to endow them with a regularity represented in geometric abstraction. He cites the fear of space, Raumscheuer, which is clearly manifested in Egyptian architecture, 
I give you Fisher von Ehrlich's pyramids. And compares what seems to him to be a generalized spiritual dread and fear of space to the modern malady of agoraphobia, or what he terms Platz Angst. In short, he sees agoraphobia identified as a contemporary malady, as something that had always attacked the question, always attacked society, especially society uh, in wide open spaces, like the deserts of Egypt, for example. And abstraction, and geometrical abstraction in particular, as the universal and continually repeated remedy against agoraphobia, the need to, in fact, establish place and establish space in a fixed and authoritarian way. In the same way as this, what he called physical dread of open places may be explained as a residue from a normal phase of development, a phase at which mankind was not yet able to trust entirely to visual impression as a means of becoming familiar with the space extended before it, but was still dependent on the assurance of the sense of touch, Voringer wrote. So the spiritual dread of open space was a throwback to a moment of instinctive fear conditioned by man's feeling of being lost in the universe. He characterized this feeling as a kind of spiritual agoraphobia in the face of the motley disorder and caprice of the phenomenal world. Indeed, Voringer concluded that the sensation of fear, or angst, was at the root of artistic creation, and particularly at the root of the creation of abstract art. And of course, in Voringer's later arguments, for the Gothic, um, he was continually juxtaposing abstraction, alienation, and agoraphobia as those things which might be overcome by a more balanced and empathetic relationship to nature. Now, while we know that Voringer's observations were made in a kind of isolation from cubist or, experiment, or expressionist experiments in abstract art, his juxtaposition of agoraphobia and abstraction was nevertheless a calculated play on the turn of the century commonplace that saw the spaces created by modern abstract geometry as the direct cause of agoraphobia, if not the entire cause of the psychopathologies of Metropolis. Interesting enough, it's in Vienna, in the writings of Camilla Zitter, the Viennese architect and critic, only eight years before Voringer, who tried to demonstrate that the, the fundamental problem of the open space created by the redevelopment of the Ringstrasse was precisely that it encouraged agoraphobia. He talks about the fashionable modern illness of agoraphobia which attacks people as they cross the wide open spaces of modern urbanism and offers as a remedy the controlled and tightly organized places or spaces of traditional towns like the Piazza del Duomo of Padua. And you all know the argument of the, the small town versus the big metropolis. But what interests me is that agoraphobia is cited as precisely the scientific evidence that demonstrates the, the terrible effects, mental and social, of modern spaces. This sense of metropolis as a pathological site was, as the sociologist Georg Simmel recognized, placed, as Simmel recognized, the metropolis as the central locus of modern spatial constructions, an amalgam of urban experience and imaginary fear, the very scale of which contrasted with the 19th century antecedent of metropolis, the big towns. And whereas the early 19th city had been understood to harbor dangerous diseases, epidemics, and equally dangerous social movements, the breeding ground of the 
all leveling masses of frightening crowds, an insanitary home of millions, a stone wilderness, the opposite of nature. The metropolis, the expanded big town, carried forward all these stigmas, but added to them those newly identified by the mental and social sciences. And rapidly after the 1870s, metropolis became the privileged territory of George Beard's neurasthenia, of Charcot's hysteria, of Carl Otto Westphal's agoraphobia, of Benjamin Ball's claustrophobia, which came very closely on the heels of agoraphobia seven years later, 1878. Metropolis was seen to shelter a nervous and feverish population, overexcited and at the same time enervated, whose mental life, as Zimmel notes in 1903, was relentlessly antisocial driven by money, and haunted by the fear of touching. Already in 1896, Zimmel speaks of this fear of contact, or fear of touching, as the, the pathological symptom that was spread endemically in turn-of-the-century Berlin. And the sociologists constructed it as a spatial fear, one that stemmed from the two, from the two rapid oscillation between closeness and distance in modern life. In this space, and I give you Georg Grosch's Metropolis painting of 1910, 1911, and a detail of that painting. In this metropolitan space, all those considered prone to neurasthenic disease, the weak, the enervated, the overstimulated, the degenerated, the bored, all in quotation marks, were bound to succumb to mental collapse. And first in line for the psychologists and psychoanalysts were those prone to those kinds of collapse, women and homosexuals. It's not surprising in the light of the common belief in what Nietzsche termed the feminization of fantasy culture, and thereby what he and others, including psychologists like Otto Weiniger and Max Nordau, saw as its decadence, to find that from the outset, urban phobias were assigned a definite place in the gendering of metropolitan psychopathology. And this despite the predominance of male patients in the case study samples of agoraphobics and claustrophobics analyzed by Westfall. He has a, in the first pamphlet that he issues in 1871, out of 11 case studies, 11 are case studies of male agoraphobics. And at the end, he demonstrates through this that agoraphobia is a woman's disease. These disorders were thought of as fundamentally female in character. And it's no accident that today agoraphobia is still called by doctors in everyday parlance, housewife's disease. This description was fully supported by Freud, who found convincing evidence that the causes of agoraphobia in women, women their fear of going out into the street, were for him directly linked to what he called their repressed inner desire to walk the streets. <coughs> Obvious, right? That is to be street walkers. If you want to be a street walker, you repress it, and therefore you can't go out into the street. Writing to Fleece in 1896, Freud announced this discovery. His theory that the mechanism of agoraphobia in women was connected to, quote, the repression of the intention to take the first man one meets in the street. <laughs> Envy of prostitution and identification. This observation followed a detailed exposition of the notion of anxiety, something that I want to develop much further in this book. As represented in the formulation, quote, anxiety about throwing oneself out of the window. And here, though, there is a certain interesting construct in the Freudian connection of agoraphobia to anxiety and anxiety to the window. You remember those uh, celebrated impressionist and post-impressionist paintings of individual solitary figures standing just behind the window curtains of their new housemanized apartments looking out onto the space, infinite space of the boulevard outside. And that, that window, which is the, the interface, of course, between the private and the public realm, a continuously challenged interface in late 19th century class gender and social structures and architectural organizations, that window becomes 
for Freud the, the moment when anxiety becomes most powerfully represented. In fact, he constructs the notion and the theory of anxiety in the, in the formula anxiety plus window. Where, as he says, the unconscious idea of going to the window to beckon a man to come up always this uh, notion of the, the woman who desperately wants to become a streetwalker. But going to the woman, window to beckon a man to come up as prostitutes do, unquote, leads to sexual release which repudiated by the preconscious is turned into anxiety. The window then is left in Freud's scheme as the only conscious motive associated with anxiety by the idea of falling out. Therefore, you supplant the notion that, the unspeakable notion that you would actually be going to the window to beckon a man out of the street by the notion that you can't go to the window because you might fall out. Hence, Freud argues, anxiety about the window is interpreted in the sense of falling out, and the window opening to the public realm is avoided. Thus, as he will later claim triumphantly, Agoraphobia seems to depend on a romance of prostitution. A woman who will not go out by herself asserts her mother's unfaithfulness. Now, I'm not going to unpack that particular um, the interesting letter and follow-up of, of essays in the inhibitions, symptoms, and anxiety essays of the, of the late 1890s of Freud. But you can see that there's a certain almost pathological insistence on the gendering of anxiety and agoraphobia, which I want to, to, to reconstrue a little bit at the end of this talk. Equally by association, and perhaps as a result of Carl Westphal's own parallel researches into homosexuality, fear of open spaces was associated with homosexuality as much as it was with femininity. We find in a in a very evocative passage uh, towards the end of Sodom and Gomorrah, Proust, endowing the Baron de Charlus, hesitating before entering Madame Verdurin's salon, uh, uh, an entry which is particularly fraught with difficulty for him as an aristocrat entering the, the salon of the upper middle class arriviste, with what he describes as the mentality of the soul of the feminine sex. Baron de Charlus, trembling like a young painter, as he enters with inclined and trembling head, eyes to the ceiling, hands plug, plunged into an, an invisible muff, the evoked form and real guardian presence of which will help the intimidated artist to cross the space, furrowed with abysses, which leads from the antechamber to the small salon without agoraphobia. In a variant, Proust was more explicit. Monsieur de Charlus will enter the Verdurin salon with the movements of bent head, his hands having the air of twisting a small handbag, characteristic of well brought up bourgeois women and of those that the Germans call homosexuals. Experiencing a certain agoraphobia, the agora here being the space of the salon that separates the door from the armchair where the mistress of the salon is seated. A very interesting entry then by Proust in the 1920s of agoraphobia into the realm of claustrophobia. All to say that this pathology of agoraphobia and claustrophobia, public space and private space, and its pathologization, joined if not caused by their common site in Metropolis, provided ready arguments for modernist architects who were eager to reconstruct the very foundations of urban space. Arguing that urban phobias were precisely the product of urban environments and that their cure was dependent on the erasure of the old city in its entirety, architects from the early 1900s on projected, as we know, images of a city restored to a natural state within which the dispersed institutions of the new society would be scattered like pavilions in a landscape garden. Reviving the late 18th century myth of transparency, both social and spatial, modernists evoked the picture of a glass city, its buildings invisible and its society open. The resulting space would be open, infinitely extended, and thereby cleansed of all mental disturbance. The idea if you eradicate the cause of agoraphobia, no more agoraphobia will be possible. The sight of healthy and presumably aerobically perfect bodies as Siegfried Gideon 
in mechanization in command stated, our period demands a type of man who can restore the lost equilibrium between inner and outer reality. It's always men doing this restoration in these texts. This equilibrium, never static, but like reality itself, involved in continuous changes like that of a tightrope dancer who by small adjustments keeps a continuous balance between his being and empty space. In a recent article reviewing a number of studies by urban geographers from David Harvey to Edward Soja, the art critic Rosalind Deutsch has pointed to the implications of Janet Wolfe's 1985 observation that, quote, from Janet Wolfe, the literature of modernity describes the experience of men. And Deutsch points to the implications of this statement for the critique of totalizing concepts of vision that fail to recognize the challenge of feminist theories of visual space. Her piece is called Men in Space and is very uh, interestingly critical of the um, pervasive um, image of the man in space in modern and postmodern spatial constructions. In this talk, I want to extend some of those insights provided by the recent gender critique of modernist space to examine further the conditions that on the surface and from a feminist perspective endowed modernism with so masculinist a basis. It's obvious that for modernist space and its late 20th century extensions are for the most part constructed by and for men. But this construction, seemingly all too obvious and worthy of little more than curt dismissal, was and still is, I think, a profoundly problematic one. Because I would see the apparently serene transparently, transparency and all dominating positivism of modernist urban space to be in fact founded on extremely shaky bases and inevitably riddled with the rejection, suppression, anxiety and phobic fear that its authors, the architects, were attempting in the first place to cure. If you just take up at random one of the most uh, uh, fundamental texts, if you like, of, uh, of modernist uh, spatial assertions, Anne Rand's Fountainhead, published in the 1940s as a kind of synthetic expression of the notion of the architect sort of welded somewhere between uh, Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright, and look at some of the formulations that Anne Rand draws not only from her own imagination, not only from her own experience of uh, early 1920s Russia, but also from her reading of Wright and Le Corbusier. You find that the, the apparent serenity and almost sort of primeval power and force of Howard Rourke, the architect, is continuously uh, founded on something much more uneasy and much more phobically uh, constructed than even Anne Rand would want to admit. The opening scene of the novel is, I would think, one of the most uh, powerful evocations of what modern space in the modern, modernist period was supposed to be. We remember, um, even in the movie, where Howard Rourke is depicted as if in a cut from the triumph of the will, will, standing on the edge of a cliff and viewed from below. On the edge of a high granite outcrop, his naked body like some latter-day Prometheus or futurist convorticist demigod seems as if cut out of the material of the cliff itself, quote, a body of long straight lines and angles each curve broken into planes. His faith, face was like a law of nature, gaunt, with high cheekbones betraying its pure Aryan ancestry, its cold gray eyes steadily betraying iron willpower, contemptuous mouth betraying a position well above the prosaic world, the mouth of an executioner or a saint, she remarks. Rourke's gaze was in the process of building and transforming his surroundings into suitable construction materials, and his sight, his body position, into a desirable building site. It's, of course, the site of falling water. He looked at the granite to be cut 
he thought, and made into walls. He looked at a tree to be split, he thought, and made into rafters. He looked at a streak of rust on the stone and thought of iron ore under the ground to be melted and emerge as girders against the sky. If nature had not rendered the place perfect, surely the architect might be permitted to cut and fill a little. These rocks, he thought, are here from me, waiting for the drill, the dynamite, and my voice, waiting to be split, ripped, pounded, reborn, waiting for the shape my hands will give them. Now, while this passionate and violent account of nature rape by the architect deserves full analysis in the concept, context of modernisms and subsequently postmodernisms' pretensions to reshape the world, in this context, I'm more interested in Howard Rourke's body and more precisely in its position in space. For this super youth was almost literally standing in midair, a kind of Icarus before the fall. I couldn't get a, a shot of Rourke, but, and I'm sure this Wright wanted to be as tall and with Howard Rourke's body. Here he is at the Guggenheim looking down. And you can imagine him in the following scene. He stood naked at the edge of a cliff. The, lay, the lake lay far below him. A frozen explosion of granite burst in flight to the sky over motionless water. The water seemed immovable, the stone flowing. The stone had the stillness of one brief moment in battle when thrust meets thrust and the currents are held in a pause more dynamic than motion. The rocks went on into the depth unchanged. They ended in the sky. So that the world seemed suspended in space, an island floating on nothing, anchored to the feet of the man on the cliff. This space is recognizable enough. Lifted by Rand from the platitudes of the romantic sublime, its philosophical tone heightened, so to speak, by Nietzsche, its characteristics of absolute height, depth, and breadth emerging in the mid-twenties as the leitmotif of idealistic modernism. Bruno Taut had celebrated it in his attempts to fabricate crystalline cities out of the Alps to form marble cliffs as magic as those to be described by Ernst Jünger. Mies van der Rohe had envisaged it as gridded and endless, a universal space of three-dimensional graph paper to be punctuated in the hard steel sections of a new classicism. Le Corbusier, finally, who had, at first, who had at first experienced it much like Rourke standing on the edge of a cliff, in his case the Acropolis, elevated it into a principle, that of ineffable space, or the space indecible. Ineffable space was, for Le Corbusier, transcendent space. It was like Rourke's, high as the sky, as deep as the clearest lake, and it stretched on all sides to the horizon. There's Le Corbusier on the Acropolis. Its qualities were those of container and contained. Le Corbusier compared the space that he called ineffable to a sounding board, resonating and reverberating with the plastic acoustics set up by the natural and man-made objects that inhabited it. Objects, if possible, freestanding, generated in Le Corbusier's terms force fields, took possession of space, orchestrated it, and made it sing or cry with harmony or pain. Such space, Le Corbusier claimed in 1947, was a discovery of modernity. The fourth dimension that a number of artists, he stated, had used to magnify space around 1910. Interesting date is the date that Virginia Woolf, I believe, dates modernity from and Gertrude Stein. The fourth dimension, says Le Corbusier, is the moment of limitless escape invoked by exceptionally just consonants of the plastic means employed. The emphasis here on escape and limitlessness. When correctly employed, this space was to have a strangely powerful effect, in Le Corbusier's terms, on the buildings that defined it and set it in motion. The space was more important for Le Corbusier than the buildings itself. In a complete and successful work, he wrote, there are hidden masses of implications, a veritable world which reveals itself to those it may concern, which means emulating Rourke's contempt to those who deserve it. Then a boundless depth open ups, effaces the walls, drives away contingent premises, accomplishes the miracle of ineffable space. Ineffable space is wallless space. The feeling 
like that described a few years earlier by Freud in a note to Romain Rolland, and he called it an oceanic feeling, again, very interestingly, experienced by Freud for the first time on the Acropolis. This feeling was virtually religious in nature for Le Corbusier. I'm not conscious of the miracle of faith, says Corbusier, but I often live that of ineffable space, the consummation of plastic emotions. It's just perhaps especially appropriate that both Le Corbusier and Freud first felt this sensation on the same cliff, that of the Acropolis. Le Corbusier recalled in 1933 his first visit 23 years ago, before. I came to Athens 23 years ago. I spent 21 days on the Acropolis working ceaselessly with this admirable spectacle. What I know is that I acquired there the idea of irreducible truth. I left crushed by the superhuman aspect of the things on the Acropolis, crushed by a truth which, which is neither smiling nor light, but which is strong, which is one, which is implacable. And in, anticip in anticipation of the inner violence of such a scene, a violence later to be unleashed on the cities of Europe by Siam, Le Corbusier concluded, remember the clear, clean, intense, economical, violent Parthenon, that cry hurled into a landscape made of grace and terror, that monument to strength and purity. Now all this could be put down to the common youthful enthusiasm shared by Rand and Le Corbusier for Nietzsche and Herbert Spencer, for a fin de siècle diet of anti-decadence and symbolist aesthetics, motivated by a quasi-religious Wagnerianism fomented by Edouard Chouret, <coughs> nourished by a good dose of Hugo's Notre Dame, which for Le Corbusier, Rand, and notably for Frank Lloyd Wright, had challenged the modern architect to rediscover the authentic roots of cultural expression. But in the same way as oceanic space was in Freud, established through what he, what he termed a disturbance of memory, itself caused by a deeper anxiety. So for Le Corbusier and for Howard Rourke, ineffable space became the instrument of suppression for almost everything that they hated about the city, if not the agent of repression of their own very highly developed and explicit phobic reactions to the city. Claustrophobia, in the face of the old city, of course, but also a link to this, that fear identified by Zimmel, the fear of touching. Zimmel speaks, as I noted, of that pathological symptom of the fear of getting into too close a contact with objects and subjects that is spread endemically nowadays, growing out of a kind, out of, a kind of hyper aesthetics in which every live and immediate contact produces pain. And it certainly doesn't take an especially attentive reader to notice that most of Anne Rand's characters all suffer from this intolerable fear of touching, if not more precise phobias. The old alcoholic architect Louis Sullivan figure, Henry Cameron, the mentor of Rourke, asks at one point in the novel, do you ever look at the people in the street? Aren't you afraid of them? I am. They move past you and they wear hats and they carry bundles. But that's not the substance of them. The substance of them is hatred for any man that loves his work. That's the only kind they fear. Well, we went and look at Dominique Franson. The Her phobia was more developed. She had always hated the streets of the city. She saw the faces streaming past her, the faces made alike by fear. Fear is a common denominator. Fear of themselves, fear of all and of one another, fear making them ready to pounce upon whatever was held sacred by any single one they met. She couldn't define the nature or the reason of that fear, but she'd always felt its presence. She had kept herself clean and free in a single passion to touch nothing. Later, she develops an unmistakable case of agoraphobia when she's confined to Gail Winan's penthouse following her marriage. Even the reliable and sensible Katie, the luckless niece of Ellsworth Toohey, the, the, um, the architectural critic, an ever patient fiance of Peter Keating, is forced to confess a phobic interlude. I was working on my research notes all day and nothing happened at all. 
no calls or visitors, and then suddenly tonight I had that feeling, it was like a nightmare, you know, the kind of horror you can't describe, it's not like anything normal at all. Just the feeling I was in mortal danger, that something was closing in on me, that I'd never escape it, because it wouldn't let me, and it was too late. Have you ever had a feeling like that, just fear you couldn't explain? She thought that maybe the room was stuffy or something. <laughs> maybe it was the silence. When she saw her Uncle Ellsworth Toohey's shadow looming huge on the wall, a kind of uncanny apparition of his future influence over her, that's when it got me. It wouldn't move that shadow. But I thought all that paper was moving. I thought it was rising very slowly off the floor and was going to come to my throat and was going to drown. That's when I screamed. And Peter, he didn't hear. Probably why Peter didn't want to get involved. <laughs> and if Rand's characters hated the city that made them sick, Le Corbusier's responses were equally pathological. Writing in 1929 on the street, he castigated that traditional canyon plunged in eternal twilight the street. Rising straight up for a minute are walls of houses, which when seen against the skyline present a grotesquely jagged silhouette of gables, attics, and zinc chimneys. At the very bottom of the scenic railway lies the street plunged in eternal twilight. The sky is a remote hope far, far above it. The street is no more than a trench, a deep cleft, a narrow passage. I'll leave you to unpack that, Mark. And although we've been accustomed to it for more than a thousand years, our hearts are always oppressed by the constriction of its enclosing walls. The street is also full of people. One must take care when one goes. For several years now, it has also been full of rapidly moving vehicles. Death threatens us at every step between the twin curbstones. But we've been trained to face the peril of being crushed between them. On Sundays, when they're empty, the streets reveal their full horror. Every aspect of human life pullulates throughout their length, a sea of lusts and faces. It's better than the theater, better than what we read in novels. The street wears us out, and when all is said and done, we have to admit it disgusts us. End of quote. The solution for both Rourke and Le Corbusier was to profess a sublime indifference and disdain for streets and people alike. Summed up in Rourke's reply to Cameron's question, have you ever noticed the people in the street? Rourke, inclining his head, but I never noticed the people in the streets. <laughs> and once not noticed, of course, these people might easily be wished away in dreams of peace and quiet, emptiness and spatial luxury. Le Corbusier again. Reason and reason alone would justify the most brilliant solutions and endorse their urgency, but suppose reason were reinforced by a well-timed lyricism. You are under the shade of trees, vast lawns spread all around you, the air is clean and pure, there's hardly any noise. What, you can't see the buildings? Look through the charmingly diapered arabesques of branches out into the sky towards those widely spaced crystal towers which soar higher than any pinnacle on earth, these translucent prisms that seem to float in the air without anchorage to the ground, flashing in summer sunshine, softly gleaming under gray winter skies, magically glittering at night clear, nightfall. These are huge blocks of offices. Those gigantic and majestic prisms of purest transparency rear their heads one upon the other in a dazzling spectacle of grandeur, serenity, gladness in infinite space. Here Le Corbusier touches on the principle that throughout the history of modernism, whether expressionist, functionalist, metaphysical, or idealist, will dominate all others, transparency. A transparency that will fin finally render buildings subjects, subject to space, absorbed and dissolved in space, penetrated from all sides by space, light and air, undercut by space, roofs planted as gardens in the sky, sky becoming natural space. And again, we've returned to one of the commonplaces of modernism. But it was a commonplace that rendered it absurdly easy to construct the notion of a city to end all cities, from Le Corbusier's project for a contemporary city of 1923 to his Plan Voisin of 1925, culminating in the Ville Verte and Ville Radieuse of 1933-1935.
With the proposal for the Cartesian skyscraper to replace the Gothic and two small towers of New York, Le Corbusier joins Howard Rourke. But would transparency on its own serve to eradicate all those phobias, psychoses, and neuroses so dear to the metropolitan doctors? For Le Corbusier and his supporters, ineffable space had finally resolved the question. In an issue of Les Cahiers de la République des Lettres of 1930, where Le Corbusier had expounded his vision of a new Paris, the doctor and friend of Le Corbusier, Maurice de Fleury, contributed an article on urban neuroses, flatly denying any relation between urban life and pathological disorders, claiming that, the all, claiming that all the so-called neurasthenic diseases were in fact hereditary. These psychoneuroses, these half-madnesses, have no other cause than heredity. They are essentially constitutional maladies. The milieu instance overexcitement are in no way their profound cause, and argued very strongly that the new space of Le Corbusier would in fact, even if these diseases were not hereditary and might perhaps be caused by space, the eradication of the space that first caused agoraphobia in the late 19th century and the universalization of all space would eradicate agoraphobia. In this way, the, the way was cleared for the muscular energy of Le Corbusier's typical man working out freely like an athlete in urban space. Oh, that's not what I wanted there. As Le Corbusier scornfully snorted in the face of late 19th century decorative art, disorder, neurasthenia, this art whose ebbing foam displays its broken fringe along our picture moldings, is not the art of the new phenomenon which captures our imagination. Maybe we can have the, the, the slides off for a second. And yet to those who recognize the inevitable place of phobia in modern life, including those who are forced by their own kinds of phobia to make it a part of modernist experience and its representation, Neurasthenia nevertheless found its role as a veritable stimulus for aesthetic experiment in the expressionist works of Grosch and his contemporaries, at the same time as operating as a complex form of resistance. And that's what I want to conclude by talking about, that phobia can be a form of resistance to the progressive and totalizing space constructions of the therapeutic modernism, the bathing in space that gets rid of agoraphobia of Le Corbusier and his doctor friends. Indeed, I would suggest that it was precisely in phobia, its recognition and even its pathological experiencing and working through that lay any possible resistance to ineffable space in the modern period. And, I, and of course, here I'm working with a number of, of, of psychologists in the 20s, uh, notably Eugène Minkowski and Ludwig Bingswanger. Here I want to frame my argument with respect to two final examples. Many others might be fine, found. First, Virginia Woolf, whose exploration of the city raised subtle but profound questions to the male tradition of urban space. And secondly, the art historian Abby Warburg, whose phantom image appeared anticipatingly on the screen just now, whose changing view of modernist space was articulated through a series of studies of traditional mythology and culture. Both Wolf and Vorberg, significantly enough, enough, not only identified phobia in the urban scene, but also succumbed to it in mental illness. And of course, in Virginia Woolf's case, very seriously. It was in Virginia Woolf's first stream of consciousness novels, and especially in Mrs. Dalloway, published in 1925, that a woman writer began to explore her complex relations to modernist urban phobia. What Clarissa Dalloway herself, the protagonist of the novel, described as a, a panic fear that accompanied her throughout life and that was precisely exacerbated in that most male and modernist of domains, the metropolis. The temporal context of Wolf's investigation was precise, 1923, five years after the cessation of hostilities in World War I, and her characterization of a London in shock a social as well as an urban trauma is pointed by the parallel histories of two protagonists. The socialite and party giver Mrs. Dalloway, whose only care in life seemed to be the organization of her invitations and the hostessing of her perfect party. And the returned shell shock victim, Septimus Smith, who gradually retreats from an intolerable world into silence and suicide. At first only randomly joined by juxtaposition 
in the park. These two oddly matched figures are inexorably paired and intertwined, coming together at the end of the novel as one. When the infamous nerve doctor, Sir William Bradshaw, brought the news of Smith's suicide to Mrs. Dalloway's party. Then it is that what seemed all along to be two disparate worlds, upper and middle class, external pleasure and internal pain, are seen as one. And it was Mrs. Dalloway who pieced it together. What business had the Bradshaws to talk of death at her party? A young man had killed himself, and they talked of it at her party. The Bradshaws talked of death. He had killed himself. But how? Always her body went through it first when she was told suddenly of an accident. Her dress flamed, her body burnt. Suppose, she thought of Septimus, he had, he had gone to Sir William Bradshaw, a great doctor, yet to her obscurely evil, without sex or lust, extremely polite to women, but capable of some indescribable outrage. Might he not then have said, life is made intolerable? Then, she had felt it only this morning, there was the terror, the overwhelming incapacity, there was in the depths of her heart, an awful fear. Wolf, of course, does not rest there. And the depiction of Clarissa herself as a mental flaneuse in London, side by side with the figure of her daughter Elizabeth, whose daring tram ride into the center establishes a kind of territorial freedom of movement for the independent woman of Wolf's imagination, would merit Janet Wolfe's attention. What I want to say here then is that despite the universalist pretensions of modernism to establish a counterphobic architecture of radiance and transparency, it was in fact not only an obviously gendered system of forms, but imposed with the very authority of belief in women's fear and the legitimacy of conquering such fear within enforced deprivation, Bradshaw's rest and silence, or socially constructed inadequacy the inability that was common to Dalloway and Smith to feel anything. The history of women's fear, felt and attested to by women from Emily Dickinson to Virginia Woolf, and as pathologized and, so to speak, invented by masculine psychoanalysis, has in this context only just begun to be written. But its spatial characteristics are fairly clear. As Woolf demonstrates, it's a spatial construction of necessary interiority either mental or physical or both, hence the ascription agora or claustrophobia. Its forms are those of stream of consciousness, of entrapment, of intolerable closure, of space without exit, of finally breakdown and often suicide. Septimus Smith, as we know, anticipated Wolf's own. I want to conclude with a case of the art historian, Abby Vorberg who, with a significant difference from Waringer and similarity to Wolf, was originally a convinced proponent of modernist progress, a progress he attributed directly to the effects of abstraction. He wrote as a, as a teenager an early play entitled Justice, Air and Light, also for the Moderns, Progress in Abbreviation. In this sense, very close to the, the modernist progressivist of Le Corbusier's heritage. For Vorberg, indeed, this distinction, the distinction between the pre-industrial and the post-industrial was precisely that reason had supplied a sufficient distance between the magical forces of nature and the phobic subject. A space, as he termed it, of reason and reflection, a Denkraum, that insulated the fearful subject from the unknown or best allowed the unknown to be comprehended and thus less feared. Accordingly, in this ascription of the early Vorberg and of many modernist architects, space was beneficent, and the more the better. Indeed, the progress that Vorberg measured seemed to increase in direct proportion to the amount of mental and physical space that might be conquered by society in order to create a sufficient barrier between nature and civilization. In these terms, he saw the Renaissance as a distinct turning point in progress, not simply, as Jacob Burkhardt had it, because of the substitution of the secular for the religious world, but because of the increasingly spatial nature of the secular world. Vorberg measured this increase by, for example, what he saw as the space-filling nature of Renaissance festivals. It was to confirm such a proposition, hardly novel since the 1870s, and we can now have that last slide, please, 
and largely drawn from psycho-historians like Lamprecht and Smarsov, that Vorberg visited the United States in 1895. Finding little to attract him in the modernized East, Vorberg traveled directly to the Pueblo Indian settlements of the Southwest. For Vorberg, these seemed to represent, despite the layers of modernization under which they were buried, true survivals of magical, symbolical cultures. He studied the three-day festival at Araibi and its tribal dances and ceremonies. But his real enthusiasm was reserved for the worship of the snake, its symbols and related dances. His assumption that the snake formed a kind of propitiation for lightning and that its handling represented the displacement of the greater fear of lightning by the lesser fear of snake was confirmed by a school teacher who showed him children's drawings with lightning forks having snake's heads. This was the early Vorberg. But by 1918, his belief in progress had been subjected to the continuing aftershock of the war. And what now appeared less as a confidence in infinite progress and more as an elaborate defense against phobia finally collapsed into a real breakdown that led to his five-year confinement in the sanatorium run by the psychiatrist Ludwig Bingswanger. It was this confinement that I would hazard was instrumental in the development of Vorberg's special understanding of modernity and its relationship to traditional culture. For it was in no way accidental that his release from the asylum, this is a kind of magic mountain story, was obtained by a wager that challenged his doctors to find fault with a lecture that he proposed carefully to prepare for delivery to the inmates of the nursing home. This lecture worked out over three years, the notes for which still exist, but which we can't read, was painstakingly constructed out of the insights of his cure and his revised recollections of his journey to the Pueblo. So Binswanger challenges him to, to give a lecture. He returns in his uh, notes to this first visit to the Pueblo, which seems to be the, 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 the point at which his whole question, the whole question of modernity, civilization, and space, and phobia come together and rewrites with a series of elaborate notes, some of which we've been given by Gombrich's transcriptions, into a new lecture, which was finally delivered as a lecture on the snake dance in 1923 to the inmates and doctors of the asylum and gained his release. This lecture, truncated and transformed and re-edited, was posthumously published as one of the only pub publications of uh, Vorberg in English uh, in the first or second volume of the uh, Vorberg Institute papers in 1927. In this lecture, Vorberg worked through his cure as an elaborate rethinking of modernism's progress, a virtual acceptance of the dangerous proximity of phobia and reason and a trenchant critique of the way in which space-conquering techniques, flight, wireless telephones, seem to him to be eroding any possibility for any stable distance of reflection, the treasured Denkram. And what you get from reading his notes, even the small number of them that we have available, is a sense of the working out of the state of modernity and the state of being in modernity, not as either civilization or mythology, either phobia or the cure of phobia, but the possibility, finally, of living with phobia in modernity. Ernst Gombrich has transcribed some of the notes and drafts for this lecture, in which Vorberg used, so to speak, his own mental illness to develop theories of ostensibly primitive but evidently autobiographical mental states. I quote, Primitive man is like a child in the dark, he is surrounded by a menacing chaos which constantly endangers his survival. So far, very much like Boringer's attestation to the fear that led to agoraphobia, that led to abstraction. The original state, therefore, is one of fear, of those phobic reflexes, to which we attach such crucial importance for the genesis of myth and ultimately of science. 
Our mind is in a constant state of readiness to take up a defensive position against the real or imagined causes of the threatening impressions which assail us. The phobic reflex which substitutes a known image, however menacing, for the dread of the unknown cause has an important biological function. Even the most fearful imaginary cause is less fearful than the dreadful unknown. In this respect, the phobic reaction prepares the ground for the mastery of the world through the act of naming and thence to the dominance of logical thought. In these terms, Vorberg finds spirituality as a result of universal terror and phobia a kind of beneficial agent. <clears throat> so the Indian, he continues, establishes the rational element in his cosmology by depicting the world like his own house, which he enters by means of a ladder. But we must not think of this world house as the simple reflection of a tranquil cosmology, for the mistress of the house is the most fearsome of all beasts, the serpent. The snake ritual has a dual function. It is an act of primitive magic and a quest for enlightenment, the counterpart to the modern control of electricity. But the latter, the control of electricity, Vorberg continues, is not without dangers. I do not have a simple belief in universal progress. The progress destroys distance. Anxieties and phobias, on the other hand, demand distance and reflection and detachment. Their causes can only be grasped through detachment and reasoning. Electricity annihilates the zone or space of reasoning, the denkron. This pessimistic conclusion to the final publication of the, state ri of the snake ritual lecture no doubt stems from this fear. Vorberg has this wonderful photographic image of an Uncle Sam with a top hat proudly striding along a road in front of an imitation classical rotunda with an electric wire stretching above his hat, seeming a symbol of the way in which what Warburg called Edison's copper serpent, or the electrical wire, has finally wrested the thunderbolt from nature. He concluded, telegram and telephone destroy the cosmos. Mythopoeic, poeic, mythopoeic and symbolic thought in their struggle to spiritualize man's relation with his environment have created space as a zone of contemplation or of reasoning. That space which the instantaneous connection of electricity destroys unless a disciplined humanity restores the inhibitions of conscience. It was in September 1929 that Vorberg heard the news of the successful docking of the Zeppelin in New York after evading a thunderstorm by using his instruments. For the art historian, it seemed to be a triumph of science and foresight symbolizing man's conquest of the elements. In his journal, he wrote, the mercury column seen as a weapon against Satan Phobos. We should, of course, be wary of drawing two portentous conclusions from these jottings of Warburg. He himself noted, they are the confessions of an incurable schizoid deposited in the archives of mental healers, a remark that serves Gombrich's own cautious approach well. But at the same time, Vorberg himself noted the force of the phobic in his own narratives. The narratives of the historian, those uncanny vaults, he says, where we found the transformers which transmute the innermost stirrings of the human soul into lasting forms. But Vorberg's breakdown should not be simply seen as an affirmation of the position soon to be espoused by followers of Heidegger and Claudel as a return to tradition would make things all right again. Rather, in his personal narrative of breakdown and recovery from modernism, the acceptance of the unhomely in the homely, we may learn something that was hidden from Rourke and Le Corbusier alike, that no amount of space or structure can make a home where no home can exist. Here, Warburg might facilitate an interpretation of modern space that would escape from stylistic or essentialist terms and measure the position of the subject in a world of rootless psyches. Such a stance would legitimate no particular manner or style, avant or neo-avant-garde, <laughs> traditional, historicist, or even deconstructionist. It would instead describe a complex movement between space and the subject, place and inhabitation, vision and drive, projection and reflection a complex movement open to multiple constructions of gender, sexuality, and difference, and fundamentally a critique of modernist space as invented 
by those men, Rourke and Le Corbusier. Thank you. <laughs>